the research out there shows that if you use your strengths, you're more likely to find value in the work that you're doing. And I think this is very important right now with burnout and everything. People that use their strengths every day, they're three times more likely to have an excellent quality of life. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. This is Kim Skorupski. And on today's episode, we are so excited to talk with Dr. Rachel Salas. Dr. Salas is one of our own Hopkins best. She is an associate professor in neurology and nursing at Johns Hopkins Medicine, the director of interprofessional education and interprofessional collaborative practice, and the director of neurology clerkship. Thank you, Dr. Salas, for being on the podcast today. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Kim, for having me. Well, I, you, you know I've been um, you know, getting in your ear about being on the Faculty Factory podcast for a while now because ever since you came to our junior faculty leadership program a year, almost a year ago now, and you talked about this strengths-based psychology, you got me all you know excited about it. And um, I've just been dying to have you come and talk to all the podcast audience about how this strengths-based psychology can help us in our careers and can help faculty and leaders as they think about um, putting teams together and just advancing in their their careers. So um, take it away. I'll try to be quiet here for a minute. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, I'm only... I just wish I had been exposed and learned about this so, you know, a lot longer, but like maybe back in med school even. But what happened is I was uh, selected to do a leadership program at the American Academy of Neurology. And as part of the program, they sent me this, you know, electronic link to go do this tool to complete this 30, 45 minute tool. And, and at first I was like, what is this horoscope thing that, that I'm doing? <laughs> but as you'll see later with my strengths, um, I, I went ahead, I did it. And for the first time, I got my little report with all, you know, nice little report. And for the first time, I was getting something where I was being recognized for my strengths, right? And because most of the time, people are identifying, especially at work, they're identifying what you're not good at, what you need to do better at, you need to get your numbers up. So I was just like, wow, like this is a, you know, a breath of fresh air. It's going to be, you know, it's positive. And so I I met with a coach. I had never in my life ever had any type of like coach coach, like somebody that you would, that's not in medicine, not a mentor, like somebody outside that really was there to hear me talk. Right. And so they said, meet with this person you know, 30 minutes to an hour. And in my head, I was thinking, I have so many other things to do because this leadership program was um, in a conference, right? And and we all know that you're either talking or running around networking, having meetings. Oh, you mean back in the old fashioned, you mean back in the old fashioned days when we had conferences with people? Back in the old days. (laughs) Yep. Pre-COVID. Yep. And, um, you know, it was for a long, maybe the first time in a long time, that I was just able to kind of think about things and reflect. And this, here is this person kind of, you know, helping me kind of walking me through, like, you know, getting to know myself, getting to learn. Like, in fact, what we'll talk about probably later is like when I learned my top five strengths, two of them, one of them, I thought, first of all, everyone had, I didn't even acknowledge it as a strength. I was Mm. like, everyone's like this. And then the uh, one of my five, I thought, that's a weakness. Like that's actually the thing that gets me in trouble all the time. <laughs> so it's just like really um, enlightening for me. And and I went home after that, that conference and that program and I couldn't take it. I emailed that coach and I was like, I just wish I like, I just wish I had this so many years before. I'm like, how can we make this happen? I said, I have a pre-med program, my pre-doc program. These are undergrads. They're looking to go into the health field. How can I bring this to them? And, you know, I, she, she got on board, you know, Carrie, she got on board and, and has been working with me um, ever since. And that was a few years ago. And, you know, for those of you that have gotten a coach and looked into this, it's, it's not cheap. Right. Right. And so, um, you know, I was like, how are we going to like sustain this. And then Carrie gave me the suggestion. She's like, why don't you go get certified as a coach? 
And I thought for a second, that has to be the most ridiculous thing for me to do. I mean, I'm full time, you know, busy. And she's like, no, you should just look into it. And so I did it. And I tell you, it was, it was the best decision ever because not only has it made me a better person in my work life and personal, but I'm now using strengths in my clinical practice. I'm doing it with patients. I'm doing it with my students, my programs. And now, um, you know, my partner in crime, uh, <laughs> Dr. Charlene Gamaldo, who's now also certified in strengths, we are starting to do like professional development and leadership workshops to really kind of help others kind of tap into this, hopefully a lot sooner than we did and really just see the benefits. Well, this this is so incredible. And I hope and I'm sure I'm confident that people listening to this podcast right now are saying, well, tell us what is it? And can you um, so tell people what it is, the tool, and then can you start walking through this application with your trainees, with your patients? Um, I'm sure people would love to hear some of your stories of how this happens. Yeah, of course. So, you know, when you look at a strengths based on psychology, there's tons of different tools out there. And I've, you know, definitely have been looking more into this. And so I kind of think of this as more that strengths based approach. However, the one tool that we are using is the Clifton Strengths one. And one of the reasons, and, and I will say, because I know there's some naysayers out there, you know, I will say that nothing's perfect, but this is a starting point. You know what I mean? And and over 20 million people globally, right? So worldwide, this thing is available in different languages, have taken it. So if you're going to have a starting point, might as well start where someone, you know, where it's more likely that other people have either done it or been exposed to it, right? Mm -hmm. And have some kind of universal language to get started. So the Clifton Strength tool is, you know, um, uh, basically there was a psychologist, Don Clifton, back in the 90s was like, why are these certain people successful? He teamed up with Gallup back then. They put this strengths thing together and they said, you know what, these are the top, these are the 34 strengths that we found and when people that these successful people when they know what their strengths are and when they put some intention behind those strengths in other words like they build they practice they they try to make those strengths you know tweak them to be better then guess what that's a strength so the definition when i say strength i'm talking about the ability to consistently provide a near perfect performance all the time you know how sometimes like you're like you're just good at something and you like know you're good and people know you're good at it. They're like, Oh, Hey Kim, you know, you're, you're good at, you have all the information, like come, come and do that. Right. People already know it there. They just didn't have a word for it. Maybe you didn't have a word for it, but it's just natural, right? It's just natural. So when, that's what I'm talking about as strength, something you don't even have to do anything. You don't have to be like, you don't have to think about it. It just naturally comes out. And so if you were to do that for your top strength, then guess what? You know, the study, the work, the research out there shows that if you use your strengths, you're more likely to find value in the work that you're doing. You're six times more likely to be engaged. You're going to have more resilience. And I think this is very important right now with burnout and everything. People that use their strengths every day and are just, you, you know, in it, they're three times more likely to rate their life, their, to have an excellent quality of life. Mm, wow. Three times more so, likely. Yeah, three times more likely. And you're more productive because you're you're in your zone. You're being recognized for what you do best. And people like acknowledge that and you're doing better. And then you start kind of, at, the more you get into it, you, you start realizing, well, what about other people? So we talk about diversity, the importance of diversity. But what about the diversity of strengths, right? So I've been really interested from the interprofessional um, standpoint, like teams, right? So what if you said, hey, you know, like, for instance, Charlene, what are her top five strengths? And, and why we always knew we had a great dynamic, but we never really knew why. And so now we have some words to understand. So I, I'm really good at getting things started. I can, I can get anything going, right? Uh -huh. That's not so easy for Charlene. But Charlene has context, like that's one of her top strengths. So I often go to her and I would say, hey, you know, this is the idea. And she would always kind of like give me some advice. But now I go to her and say, hey, I have this idea. I want to get it started. I need your context. Like, can you help me? Like, you know, like, let's make this better. And what we found is by our language changing and by us understanding what she's naturally good and what I'm naturally good at, 
our partnership has really skyrocketed. And we've even branched out and we're doing this in our sleep center. We're really recognizing, you know, like our, our, our respiratory therapist, for instance, Danya, high in positivity. You know, and if you think about it, you're in a busy clinic, patients get upset, there's just, you know, th- things are happening. And I say, Danya, I need your positivity. I got to move on to the next patient. But this patient is frustrated. And, blah, blah, blah. and she lights up because she's being recognized. Like, and she knows she's good at that. She knows she's good at bringing that positive. And so she goes in, does her thing. I'm not, I mean, I, I, I would say I'm a positive person, but I wouldn't say that it's like always natural, right? And you just know what to say like it is for her. So it's just been a tremendous tool, like in all the different domains of my life. Uh, Rachel, I just, I'm so excited. I'm just energetic listening to you because I can see and feel this dynamic, this energy, because what a complete flip-flop on our natural, normal lives in academic medicine that are rife with criticism. Your papers Mm -hmm. are rejected. Our grants are rejected. We need to, as you said, work on our communication skills and work on our tone and be kinder and gentler and more understanding. And we feel like we're never good enough. And it's the imposter syndrome and constantly berating ourselves and not making it whatever it is. And so I feel like we beat ourselves up all the time and because we're all high overachievers in academic medicine, it's even worse. We have such a high bar for ourselves. So I love, love, love that this just turns everything upside down and says, wait a minute, look at what you are naturally gifted with. And let's use the opportunity to, as you said, let that shine. And not only Mm -hmm. in ourselves acknowledging, hey, I am good at that for crying out loud, but also as leaders helping others to identify their own things. And what a, what a reversal of the typical scenario that we all think of as leaders of giving people constructive criticism. And you're not good at that. You need to work on that. Remember, we're trying to work on A, B, and C. This is such a breath of fresh air. And it must feel so good to be a patient in your sleep clinic and to be working with you. Tell us more about how you've applied it and how this works. Yeah, I mean, at this point, and I've talked to um, my administrator and, 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 you know, kind of like program managers, I I just, at some point, I'm going to make it a requirement. Like, if you're a new patient for me, like, I need to have this. Because what happens is you walk in the room, we have a set amount of time to see this patient, figure out what's going on, and, you know, what are we going to do to make this better? How are we going to help this person? Back in the old days, you know, like, the, you know, pe- there were more house visits. You could, a doctor could go to the house. You would see the family member. You would see the environment. You would get, you know, some insight on who they are, what they value, what their resources are. I don't get any of that. In fact, it's even worse because I have a computer in front of me, right? Right. And so you don't, you just don't get the full picture. But what if I could walk in and know like, oh, this is my patient and this is kind of like their top five. Like, this, so, oh, they're high in analytical, for example. I know this patient's going to want to see the data. I'm going to have to, like, highlight, circle some data for them, explain it. If I have another patient who is high in responsibility, that's another strength. These people, like, will do, I know they're going to follow through the plan, right? You know, so I know that, that those, they, they just need to know what to do, a to-do list. Yes. And speaking of to-do lists, and this is one of your strengths, achiever, right? So the achievers tend to love to have checklists, like, oh, I did these things. What's next on the list? I got to get it done. When I have achievers in the clinic, you know, again, I know that they're going to be motivated to do that. What's interesting, and 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 this has been something I've I've been you know kind of looking into, is like when you when you have your strengths identified. We talk about them as strengths, but really, like, when you do the assessment, you find out, like, oh, these are my top. I mentioned earlier that one of them I thought was one of my weaknesses, right? Yeah. And the reason behind that was because it was so raw. Like, I couldn't control it. I didn't even know what it was. First of all, I just knew it got me in trouble, but I didn't know what it was. (laughs) I couldn't understand it. But now, like, ever since I I was like, well, that's my problem, child. I'm going to work on it for a year. And I can tell you, I haven't had so much success since, right? So when I see people in the clinic, especially with sleep, right? Think about the people with insomnia, the worriers, the thinkers, like, oh, what do I have to do? What haven't I done? Oh, my God, I got to do this. I got to do that. Like, 
I'm wondering, is it their natural talents that are raw, just like my activator, right? Yes. So I, I was, th- this is perfect. And I wanted to put um, some words then around this because you've hinted at this twice. And I'm sure some people are saying, well, what are these words? What is this strength you're talking about? So you just mentioned your bugaboo is activator. Your other four strengths are individualization, strategic, adaptability, and arranger. So with this activator, can you give us a little bit of an insight to where you thrive and where you look for support to amplify those strengths? Yeah. So the activator, these are the people that get things going, right? Like I'm, I'm going to be honest, like, and I have insight because I've been thinking about this and learning about it. My, like, if you want to talk about weaknesses, weaknesses are not your bottom of the 34 strengths, right? That's not, that's just not who you are. Like you're never that. But my weakness on the activator side, so sure, I can get things started like nobody's business. Finishing it, that's a problem, right? So I got to look to people on my team that are responsible, that are achievers. Like they got to check that off the list, right? They're going to be a little bit more detailed. So it's also like kind of a flip for me realizing that my strengths are, 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 are act- and my weaknesses are actually hidden in there. We even call it the shadow side, you know? Yeah. And so I think that was huge because I think a lot of times before that, when you talk about imposter phenomenon, I think a lot of people look at weaknesses as, and, and it's just, they're not weaknesses. It's just, that's not you. That's not you. Right. And it's never going to be you. So let's focus on what's, what's good. So the activator um, was, yeah, again, and then individualization, like, what the heck is that, right? Like, I would have never, on an interview, if somebody said, what are your strengths? I wouldn't have been like, well, individualization is obviously. (laughs) So that one is my number one. And it's probably why I've embraced the strengths-based approach, which individualization is all about, like, everyone has their unique story. They're, you know, diff, you know, like they have, they're, they're unique in their own way. Not necessarily special. I'm going to make that caveat for a second, but, <laughs> you but unique, <laughs> right? Unique. And so I think that's why in many ways, like the students, especially like the pre-meds and even the medical students, like when they, when I serve as their mentor, I think they really resonate because I care about like who they are. And I really like that. I love the whole diamond in the rough, right? Like I want to pick out like, I know you have some good stuff. Let's find it. And, uh-huh. and Charlene comes to me because of my individualization when we're trying to hire someone. She's like, Rachel, you do the job interview because I'm usually very good at like this person. I think they would be really awesome in this position. And I thought that that was the one strength that happened to be my number one that I thought everyone had. I was oh. like, yeah, everyone does this, right? So you mm-hmm. off play it. And that's where it makes imposter phenomena even more likely when you think that that's not a strength, you think, Oh, everyone's like that. It's obvious. Because it's so and I easy. Thought that. Yeah. I, I right. love that. Exactly. Because I remember when I talked to somebody, when I first started doing faculty development and they said, Oh, you're so good at this. And you know, you're, you're really just great. And I rolled my eyes like so big and I was like, come on, really? I'm like, anybody could do this. And I dismissed it and started walking out of the room and she almost like physically grabbed me and said, no, wait a minute. You don't understand something. Um, it's easy for you. Not everybody can do what you're doing. You're just frustrated because you think it's so easy, but it's so easy for you because that's your gift that it's, it is. Mm-hmm. And she didn't use the word strength, but she said, it's your gift. And I thought, come on. But what you're saying to me is makes so much sense that we, we don't give ourselves credit for these strengths necessarily because they're so easy to us and so natural. We shrug them off because it's like, to me, I use the language, this is like falling off of a log. You can get anybody to come in here and do this thing and fall off a log just like I do. And she was like, oh, au contraire, no. And so you're saying something that I think is so important that everybody has a strength and has these top five, but it's just a no brainer to you. So you think, duh, but it's, mm-hmm. it's not, it's, it's, it's a duh for you. But for a lot of us, we admire the way you do thus and such that I could never do those things. So I just think it's so yep. incredibly valuable on so many levels, personal, like you said, in career and as a leader to recognize that and applaud it and then also help other people to see that in them. Oh, totally. And, and, and you know what? One of the biggest take home for me after doing this and learning more about it, it's not personal. It's not personal, right? Like if, 
I remember even as a chief resident way back, you know, and, and people would be like, quite, well, why did you do that? Like, how come you didn't do this? And I'd be like, why are you questioning me? I'm the chief, right? <laughs> and and now I realize, like, no, they were probably just a learner or or they just wanted to know why. Like, cause they, they're curious. Or what if they're analytical? They just looked at the data and, you know, wanted to understand. Yes. And so I think now it's helped me kind of just like let it go. It's not, a, it's not about me. It's actually who you are, right? right? And it's not personal. And you're less defensive. I think the same thing with the Myers-Briggs when I learned I like the list making and organized and structure. And with all these things, I would tend to beat myself up with that and, and being annoyed with people for being so disorganized, in my opinion. But that's when I realized, oh, they're a perceiver. They're, they don't like to be tied to deadlines because they don't want to lose opportunities. Or if I push them to hurry up and get it done, which Jays like to do, hurry up, get her done, which can be a benefit for us. The weakness in that is that we can miss opportunities. And the P's are really good. The perceivers are good at saying, let's take our time. I like the process mm-hmm. here. We don't want to miss something. And so that, you know, when you say it's not personal, it reminds me of that personality preferences that you you stop being so critical of people thinking, what a jerk, or he doesn't like me, or she's so mean. It's not personal. It is that their preferences are to be this way. And so when you, as you put it so nicely, when you get the language and you kind of shift your vision, your field of vision and the way you look and think about something, it really, I think, can help help relationships just in general. Yeah. I mean, it's been a really a great lens for myself to know, like, why do I get annoyed? Like when you get annoyed, I would just be like, it's that person, right? It's not me. It's that person. It's like, no, now I know, like, no, you're annoyed because you're an activator and you don't like it when people are like stalling. I don't like it when people say no, you know, Uh (laughs) I'm like, no, I can do this. I can do this. right? Right. And, but now I was like, it's, that's my, that's me. I'm, I'm why I'm annoyed. (laughs) <laughs> and so like coming up with those strategies to like not get that and be like, oh, this is just my activator settle it down. Let's move on. You right, know? Right. So let's put five more words on the, on the table. And they're my five words because it, again, you got me so excited about the Clifton strengths that I did it. And I spent an hour with the coach in the same way with you. I was, again, we all have the whole horoscopy, like this is so weird. And <laughs> uh, when you said you have to talk to this coach, I was kind of like, really? And the first like five, maybe almost 10 minutes talking with her, I could almost hear her humor with me because I was kind of like harumphing and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden she started describing me and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's looked into my soul. She totally gets me. And then she had me hooked. And by the end of the hour, I was like wanting to be her best friend because it was amazing the insight. But my five words, my five top strengths are input, strategic, like you is also my second one, like it's your second one, futuristic, achiever, and intellection. So where do I get into trouble with my strengths or where, let's not take the negative, let's talk about my strengths and how that serves me. And then I'll maybe tell you where I get into trouble with that. I mean, once I learned your strengths, I mean, again, I had some insight because like once you kind of know who you are and your language in the terms of strengths, you can kind of strength spot people and be like, ah, you know, Kim's probably, I don't know if she's a learner or input or what, but it's like, I, and I've done this. You, you can vouch. I've emailed you and said, hey, Kim, like, do you know of any, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in this. Do you know of anything or can you connect me with someone? You're right. like, here's the, here's the link. Click here. There it is. Cause of your input, you collect Yes. Things, right? You like save the papers. I'm sure your desktop may may maybe it's organized because of your achiever, but you have a lot of stuff and you keep it because yes. it might be useful soon, right? Absolutely. And then of course you're strategic. But the other thing that I like and go to you for is your futuristic, mm-hmm. right? right? Thinking ahead, not just your strategic, but thinking your I love that you can bring in your strategic for your futuristic, right? So like for a mentee, right? If I say Kim, like you know what, I'm kind of thinking about my next stage of life, like, what's my next chapter? And like, you know, like, from what you know of me, like, wh- what do you think, you know, and, and man, that first, that'll light you up. But what it'll you will use your strategic and your futuristic and be like, hey, Rachel, like, you're really good at this. Like, have you ever thought about this? You yeah. know? Yeah. And that's exactly what I do all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And and what uh, where I get into trouble when I get frustrated with people and and get into my you know lizard brain part of like oh want to stomp my hands and stomp my feet um, is when people don't see or won't buy into my vision of being strategic and what the future looks like and being the achiever and the intellection and trying to like push things through and I can see something mm-hmm. and I get frustrated when um people slow me down or say no or can't do it or look at me like I'm crazy. And I, and I get really um, frustrated by that feeling like they, you can't see this. Isn't it obvious? Right. And, and, and that's, that's, that's perfect because you've identified not a weakness, but just what your need is, right? And your need is to find someone high in communication. Like one of the communication domains, but you could be doing the most fabulous work, right? But if no one knows, then it's not out there. And, and you know, you're, you're not going to have those opportunities. So by tapping into people that are high on, like, communication, they're going to be able to, ha- you know, to help get the word out. Exactly. Um, activator, the, the one for me that's in the communication, like, I can get it started. So, like, I don't like to be told no either. But if you're like, hey, Rachel, like, I got this brilliant idea. And if I buy in and I probably would with my strategic because you and I share that I'd be like, yeah, let's get this started and let's do it because people are going to tell us no, but I learned the secret word for activators and it's called pilot. (laughs) We're just going to pilot it. We don't need 15 meetings. We don't need 15 minutes. We're just going to test it out. There's no commitment. A little bit of test. We're just going to do it. Right. (laughs) That is so, so true. And and you you hit on something with me that is the details. I, I tend to kind of I collect a lot of information. Um, You're right. And looking forward and strategic and thinking, I I get annoyed by sometimes the the minutia. And so, and Mm -hmm. the communication exactly is I also get frustrated because I feel like, well, I shouldn't have to communicate this. It's just obvious. (laughs) And so I have to make sure on my team, I have people who are really good at understanding the different ways to communicate, the different platforms and you know, like you're really good on on the on social, and I had to get someone who would slow me down and help me appreciate the value of this detail and communicating because I'm always like way ahead, and um, they kind of clean up after me and make sure everything is you know happening the way it should. So I I've appreciated um, not only giving myself a little bit of leeway and and understanding myself better and understanding others better. But looking for that complementing styles and recognizing where I might have challenges because of these strengths that, that, that are, if they're overplayed, just like in personality preferences, these things are, there's nothing bad about us. But when you overplay or are in stress, you can, you know, go into the, um, overdo things and then you really uh, find yourself struggling because you are missing some of those other key components. All the more important, as you mentioned earlier, diversity of everything, diversity in all of its facets are just, as you said, this past year, you've been more successful than ever because you've been able to leverage all these strengths. And it's the same thing with me. If you've you've got a team of people around you all bringing diverse opinions and perspectives and strengths, oh my gosh, there's no way you can fail. There's no way. Right. Right. Yeah. And the literature supports that. And I, I mean, I, I think that that's a lesson learned for me, too, is like, I, you know, with my adaptability and ranger, like I can just like COVID hit. I was like, all right, moving along. Like, let's try this. Let's try that. We're going to change as we go. No problem. That is perfect. for somebody who's like very disciplined. That's another strength or responsibility. They're like, whoa, like what, what's the world? There's rules. We got, and I'm like, no, we can go with the flow and learn as we go. Yeah. So you know, but, but so now I've learned like, you know, Rachel, it's important to go for these people. Once you know that that's who they are to just explain, right. And just say like, this is what we're going to do. And this is and this is why and it's okay. Right. Yeah. And then they jump on board rather than let them kind of like, what is, you know, and that was my problem. That's why it was a, a, a weakness before, because I wouldn't explain as much. So they would, people would just easily could just say like, Oh, there she goes again, jumping right. the gun, starting another thing. Yes. And and I didn't take the time to explain my strategic strategy behind it. I totally hear that. That is so important. And, and it all comes from pausing, taking a moment. It's like, I think a lot of this is based in emotional intelligence where you know yourself to better manage yourself. 
and knowing others to better manage relationships. This is just another wonderful tool um, that is clearly shown to have great success for you and your trainees, your patients, your just your career productivity, your your research team. So I think it's wonderful. Um, I'm sure everyone listening is equally impressed with the Clifton Strengths tool. Um, before we close out and I tell people how to get in touch with you, is there anything else you'd like to say or share with the group? I mean, I, I think that you know, like if you're looking for like a, just again a, a new starting point that's more on the positive flip side than the negative, then you may want to check it out. And and I'm hoping you know with 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 your support, Kim, you know through the OFD, the Office of Faculty Development at Hopkins, that we can kind of I know we're going to do a test pilot like coming up in October and see how that goes. But you know, I think if people are really interested in that, um, that we could post some of these sessions and really kind of really build up not only individuals, but teams, you know, yeah. so that we could all work together, have more well, you know, wellness and, and get through, especially right now with everything going on in the world. Right. Oh my gosh. Well said this, is, there's probably no better time than to have a silver lining. And what a great way to remind people of the, the good things, the positives, the, the things that we can appreciate versus looking at so many of the obvious gaps and challenges we have. So wonderful, wonderful, great stuff. I know you're all excited to hear more about this. You've been learning from Dr. Rachel Salas and you can find her, uh, her Twitter handle is at Rachel Salas MD. That's again at Rachel Salas MD. You can email her at R S A L A S three at jhmi.edu. Dr. Sells, thank you so much for spending time with us today on the Faculty Factory Podcast. Of course. Thanks for having me. Bye, everybody. See you next time. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.